I welcome everyone also. Um, our workshop today will be led by Dave Russell with uh, three other speakers. And before we get started, uh, let me turn things over to John. Thank you, Dave. And uh, good morning, everyone. Good afternoon. Good evening, uh, wherever you may be. Uh, welcome to uh, yet another uh, Ivan meeting. I think this is 25 or 26 in our uh, Zoom format, uh, which uh, not so incidentally, uh, we're uh, quickly approaching uh, two years in uh, uh, using our uh, uh, online uh, uh, monthly and uh, sometimes twice monthly uh, uh, Zoom format. Uh, very, very happy to have uh, everyone uh, here with us today. Uh, as always, a great lineup of uh, uh, speakers, great subject material. Uh, I think everyone will uh, uh, find it enjoyable and useful. Uh, MR Resources and uh, Q1 Instruments are very, very pleased to uh, uh, be sponsoring these meetings. In incidentally, I wanted to mention that uh, uh, finally we have our uh, uh, next uh, uh, in-person live meeting scheduled, uh, still a little bit out uh, uh, April of uh, 22 in uh, conjunction with uh, ENC uh, in uh, Orlando, Florida uh, next year. Hope everyone can join us. But anyways, uh, once again, uh, MR and uh, Q1, very happy to uh, uh, be sponsoring these meetings. Uh, MR Resources, of course, been around for, uh, gee, 36 years uh, at this point. And uh, uh, as always, uh, uh, able to, uh, willing and able to help you out with your uh, requirements for uh, uh, quench system uh, magnet quench recovery, uh, repairs, service contracts, system moving, and uh, reconditioned uh, NMR spectrometers. And uh, also uh, Q1 Instruments, a bit more of a newcomer uh, uh, to the uh, industry, but uh, uh, we've got Don Bouchard uh, with us today, uh, Q1 Product Manager. And uh, Don, uh, uh, maybe uh, you have a few words to uh, uh, give us on Q1, uh, please. I sure do, John. Q1 designs and manufactures complete NMR spectrometers from 400 to 600 megahertz for both routine use and the research lab. Want to upgrade an older system? Q1 can retrofit AS and Ultra Shield magnets with complete upgrades, including automation, STM probe for less than you think. Q1 offers excellent performance at an unbeatable price. For example, uh, for varying users, a Mercury or Mercury Plus system can be verted, converted to a Q1 console pre-amplifier and workstation for as little as 150K. Q1's operating environment is Spin Studio J, which has a plug-in based paradigm for extending virtually any capability, either internal to the spectrometer or external via Java-based tool, extending data acquisition analysis and connectivity. The list of tools increases with every release here are a few graphical tools that greatly simplify operation. The smart tune and match facility is fast and easy to use. Just select the nucleus and click start. The automation tools is multi-user with user security. And the one in 3D gradient shimming is fast and reliable. Shape pulses extend the repertoire of experiments and our patented deep learning NUS technology is unparalleled. Want to learn more about Q1? Contact us for a no-risk remote demonstration. Thank you very much. Th thank you, Don. And uh, very, very uh, uh, important product lineup, uh, very capable. And uh, uh, Q1, the folks at Q1 are uh, definitely bringing some uh, comp much needed competition uh, back to the uh, uh, NMR industry. Anyways, uh, back to you, Dave, uh, if you could uh, give us some insight on uh, uh, upcoming meetings and then uh, get things uh, kicked off for us, please. Okay, great. Um, Krish is traveling for today, so he couldn't be here. Uh, but I'll just mention that our next upcoming meeting is on Thursday, November 18th, and the subject will be reaction monitoring uh, by NMR. And, uh, and uh, my, I did not um, write down the leader, I apologize for that, uh, but you can see it on the website. And uh, we have a few more meetings coming up. Um, Benchtop NMR in January uh, with Paul Boyer. Uh, spe uh, spectral fitting for February. 
and QNMR for March, and then we'll be into our uh, next live meeting uh, at the Orlando ENC. And there, Chris has a few more lined up for, I think he's got it up to May. And so, um, so there's a lot coming. Uh, so uh, why don't we get things started? And I will turn the floor over to our um, panel leader, uh, Dave Russell. Thank you, Dave. Welcome, everybody. Um, as everybody, we've talked for many years about how um, NMR has become much more common in the pharmaceutical world. We've assembled a very interesting group of speakers today. Uh, we're going to have Till talk to us about uh, fluorine NMR and drug discovery and how that intersects with bio NMR. Hightao is here to talk to us a bit about QNMR or uh, quantitative NMR with fluorine and how that's used in the metabolite world. And then uh, Jose is going to bring us home with reaction monitoring by fluorine, which is near and dear to my heart. So, Till, all yours. Thanks, Dave. And it's a thrill and a pleasure to be with you all today. Uh, it's really, if I hear the program that, uh, that you just sort of said will be coming up, it's exactly what is on my mind in the day to day of running NMR in, in the pharmaceutical industry. And so uh, it's a thrill to be here. Thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, what I've done is I wanted to basically just give you a, an, an overview of the applications in drug discovery without a lot of depth and just to fuel the discussion and then sort of basically provoke some comments out of the audience. And, uh, and so I'll kick off with, and, and this is obviously tinted because uh, a lot of the work that I've done myself has been in drug discovery. Um, I'll just see if I can, okay. Um, and so uh, it's always fun to sort of say, oh, you want to measure fluorine? Well, how do you isotopically label fluorine? Um, well, 19F is the natural isotope of fluorine. So there's nothing uh, uh, that needs to be done. You have a fluorinated compound, then you can measure it in the NMR tube. And it is nearly as sensitive as the proton. And uh, I don't know if this ever happened to you, but when I was a rookie and learning NMR, uh, Knut, who was the physicist in our lab and sort of my mentor in, in all things NMR, handed me a sample and said, here, this is a pharmaceutical student who wants to measure fluorine. So go for it. And I said, well, how do I do this? And he said, oh, you, you know, you just sort of st stick a sodium fluoride sample in there and then you start uh, pulsing on the fluorine channel and then just switch, you tw twiddle around with the tune and match uh, screws until you get a, a fluorine or get an FID on the screen. And that's exactly what I did. So Actually, measuring fluorine is, is extremely easy to do. Uh, it is extremely versatile because it has this huge chemical shift dispersion that makes it uh, ideal for, for applications such as drug discovery. And I'll, I'll, I'll uh, feed you a bit of detail around that. Uh, we have uh, fluorine cryoprobes now, so high sensitivity uh, uh, fluorine detection. Um, which plays a huge role in, in pharmaceutical industry because you're always limited in the amount of protein you have and also limited in the concentrations that you want to use. Um, and then um, you have a lot of uh, drugs actually that uh, have fluorine atoms in them so that very often you have a starting ligand in a certain uh, uh, drug discovery program that you can use as a reference. And all of these make it uh, really quite attractive to use uh, fluorine in, in, in drug discovery. And of course, uh, my, um, my uh, major activity at Genentech while I was still there was around uh, what's called fragment-based lead discovery, an alternate method to HTS that, uh, that came up um, starting with uh, Stephen Fezzik's SAR by NMR and this has sort of picked up and has been really quite successful. And here, uh, uh, the potential impact in this uh, typical pharmaceutical pipeline is in the HIT identification phase. Um, 19F library screening is really fast. So uh, here's an example of a mixture of 128 aliphatic and aromatic compounds with a, a, uh, an APO and then a protein added state. And then some of these signals uh, start becoming broadened out because they interact with the, with the target that you're throwing in. And that's a really fast way to identify potential binders to, to target proteins. 
And then, of course, there has to be some follow up uh, of, of uh, biophysical nature or of biochemical nature, such as SPR or MST or chemical shift perturbations, as you want to prove to your teams that these compounds are actually binding the target, that they have a certain affinity and that they're binding the target in the right place. And so apropos right place, you can also use fluorine in a competition setting. And that allows you actually to apply 19F in a much broader context of, of drug discovery, in both uh, the, the, where you're trying to characterize how small molecule ligands are actually engaging the target, but you can use it to hit, uh, identify hits, but also in the phases where your uh, chemists are uh, optimizing their leads and trying to uh, get gains in affinity. And in this case, you're, you have a competition setting, so you have your protein and ligand together, and then you throw in a competitor, and that competitor kicks out uh, your original ligand. Your original ligand is, is, uh, has a fluorine label on it, and so based upon the, uh, the behavior of that uh, fluorine signal in your NMR, you can very easily detect the, the fact that your compound is binding in the right place. But, and that's the nice thing about this, is a very quick way to get both a relative and if you use something like um, um, fraction bound calculations, actually an absolute value for affinity, which is in these phases uh, in, in drug discovery, extremely important. You can also use these methods to label proteins um, by either adding fluorinated amino acids into the uh, E. coli production media where you're, you're expressing the protein or after expression of unlabeled proteins um, by, uh, by chemically modifying these proteins. This is an example for, uh, from antibodies where you have these uh, succinamide groups that uh, readily react with the, with the target protein, labeling it in certain places. And this approach, for example, was used to probe the, uh, the dynamic behavior of uh, GPCRs, which is, of course, for pharmaceutical research, a huge topic, as uh, really a lot of the targets that we would like to address uh, are GPCRs. And um, the mode of action, the mechanisms that uh, GP, uh, GPCRs have for their, for their activity are very, very subtle and involve certain uh, changes of dynamics or populations of certain states. And here in this example, fluorine was used to probe exactly those states and uh, get an idea of how certain drugs, and in this case, antagonists and agonists, actually affect the dynamics in certain parts of the protein. And I think this is extremely powerful, uh, very focused approach, and can then help uh, delineate the mechanisms and also, of course, characterize the, the uh, compounds that the chemists are producing in, in drug discovery programs to try to push them in certain directions. Do you really want an agonist? Do you want an agonist that does a, a very specific uh, a dynamic change uh, in comparison to, say, a, a different molecule that might be a mixed uh, binding mode, et cetera? Then I would point out, I've done some studies here uh, using solid state 19F, um, I think is also quite powerful. Uh, pharmaceutical uh, industry uses solid state NMR very uh, a lot to characterize the morphological state of their drug products. And here we have an example where in black, you see multiple amorphous states overlaid and uh, two different crystalline states. Now, you can use this in principle just as a fingerprint to make sure that the API that you're producing has the correct crystal form, um, because this is extremely important for, for, for basically everything, uh, starting from dissolution of those compounds in, in your stomach. And so you can use this as a fingerprint to make sure you have the right form. Sometimes, though, there's also a question about what is the, 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 the structure of this molecule in the crystal lattice, and uh, solid state can, I think, inform very nicely uh, on that as well. And then, finally, I did want to sort of touch on uh, uh, use of 19F in imaging, um, because I always thought, why do we not do this more? Um, I think this is slowly developing with the with the availability of certain uh, compounds, but also the improvements in the imaging uh, and the sensitivities of the imaging devices themselves. This is often really quite, uh, 
quite simple in terms of the chemistry used. For example, this is simply a, a dosing of a, um, um, a perfluorohydrocarbon here um, before treatment. And then uh, this is uh, the induction of an infarction in a, a rat heart. And you can sort of see the fluorine accumulates in certain um, immune cells. And these immune cells then go to the place where the inflammation is taking place. And you can very nicely overlay now proton and fluorine images to get an idea of what is happening. And then finally, I'll just quickly touch on the use of uh, fluorinated gases in the imaging of lungs, which uh, is also um, um, something that, uh, th that is uh, uh, important. Uh, and it's not necessarily drug discovery, but it is the latter phases of then um, as the drug uh, goes to market and these studies can be very important. So I'd like to finish off with my favorite anecdote around 19F. I, uh, I received a compound from my favorite chemist uh, that said, oh, this, this happens to have a fluorine and I want to know what the affinity is. I uh, dissolved the compound in, in uh, aqueous buffer and actually had two fluorine signals. And, um, and then I titrated in the protein. It was interesting because one of the signals disappeared whereas the other remained until uh, I'd over titrated. Uh, and when I reached a one-to-one -one ratio, both of the signals had disappeared. And this was really sort of a, a revelation of how sensitive actually fluorine is to structural, uh, uh, to conformational changes. What had happened in fact was we had uh, two rotomers so it's the same molecule, but they were trapped in, in two different conformations. And the interesting piece about this, and I found so fascinating, is that actually one of them had higher binding affinity to the, to the target uh, than the other one. So I think, uh, from my experience, fluorine uh, has a, a, a bright and big future in pharmaceutical research overall. And um, with that, I will hand back to, uh, uh, to Dave and... Um, and look forward to the discussion after the presentations. Thank you, Till. That was excellent. A very nice overview of something we don't see a lot of in Ivan, which is some of the bio-NMR applications. I like that very much. Thank you. Next up is Hightal. Hightal? Yes. So first of all, uh, thanks to uh, David Russo and the other organizers for inviting me to uh, speak at the Ivan workshop. So I'm going to today, I'm going to talk about how we use fluorine MR uh, in drug disposition at Eli Lilly. Um, so depending on the stage of the program, the drug discovery program, uh, in drug disposition, we're concerned with different questions. So in the early stage, uh, our discovery stage, this is preclinical research, uh, we're concerned with basically three questions. So uh, mass balance, uh, or in other words, how much goes in and how much goes out, right? And then oftentimes they want to know what is the major elimination pathway. Uh, for example, renal versus uh, hepatic. And then finally, you know, of course, we're interested in uh, what are the metabolites, right? So this is the last question, metabolite uh, profiling. And uh, this will also give us uh, an, a view of the extent of the metabolite. And Sorry, I'm hearing some background noise. Um, and then in development, we're uh, concerned with slightly different questions. So first of all, you know, we're, we're working with human metabolites now, right? So we're, we wanna know what is the human metabolite coverage? And then what is the uh, metabolite, a uh, metabolism-based drug interaction? So in other words, uh, we wanna be able to quantitate circulating metabolites. And then of course, in early de uh, development, we're also interested in uh, mass balance. So this is traditionally done using radio labeled material uh, and you know, in the combination with LCMS. And uh, it can be quite expensive and it's usually only done in the development stage. But we could actually uh, do um, a lot of these, actually most of these um, by flooring NMR as well, if your drug uh, has a flooring. Now, if you look at the, look in the literature, and I think uh, there's an increasing number of drugs that have uh, fluorine in it. Uh, I think at the time we published our paper, uh, there were 40% of the drugs that were uh, that contained at least one fluorine. Um, so I think you know, and Till actually set this up very nicely in his presentation. So 
this is basically why we want to use 4NMR to study metabolism. It's uh, very sensitive, so it's 100% natural abundance. No, label, no labeling is required. It's a C1 half. It usually has fairly narrow line width. It also has a huge chemical shift range. It can be up to like 500 ppm. So of course, um, that can give you a much better resolution compared to um, proton and carbon. And uh, so like the uh, real label, like uh, you know, for example, carbon-14, you can think of fluorine almost like a tracer, right? So therefore you can use this to study uh, metabolism and elimination of drug uh, candidates. And also another added bonus of fluorine MR is there is no naturally occurring uh, fluorine in, in, uh, in the cell. So uh, therefore there's no interfering uh, endogenous spectrum. So that gives you a very clean uh, spectrum. And uh, also uh, you avoid issues with dynamic range if you have some of the metabolites that are significantly more uh, concentrated or more abundant than others. And also you can, you can study mixtures, that's not a problem. You don't even have to separate them. And uh, finally, it requires uh, minimal sample handling. So the head sample handling are pretty similar to what you would have in the conventional radio labeling approach. So this slide here, I just want to show you one example. So this is um, basically the top panel is the uh, proton spectrum of a rat urine. You can see that it's very, very uh, com complex. Uh, here, some of the major uh, metabolites are, are identified. And then if you look at the bottom, so this is actually uh, a urine from uh, pifloxacin traded rat rats. This is the F, uh, F19 NMR spectrum. And you can see this is a compound that has an aromatic fluorine. And you can actually see the spectrum is very, very simple. You see uh, the parent compound as well as some of the major metabolites. And you can actually even see some of the minor metabolites. Uh, you know, it's, it's completely free of any background signal. So, um, you know, we actually use pefloxacin to uh, as a case study to validate our method. And here you can see this is basically a head-to-head -head comparison with the uh, conventional radio labeling. You can see here we're interested in uh, studying the exposure and also uh, the mass balance and so forth. And so these are some of the matrices that we collected. And here is the reference to the, uh, to the paper. This one pu was published back in 2015. And uh, so this is quantitative um, NMR basically. And you can see that, uh, so basically we can make up um, standards in different matrices. So here are the four examples, uh, plasma, urine, bile, and pieces. And here the, um, <clears throat> the, the uh, concentration ranges from zero to in this case, 30 micromolar or you know, 300 micromolar. Uh, it really depends on what's the expected concentration in the corresponding uh, or the respective uh, matrix. As you can see here, um, you know, as long as you set up the experiment correctly, uh, the, linear, the linear range is actually quite wide. You, know, you can see it's, uh, the R value actually is greater than 0.99, R square value is greater than 0.99 in all cases. So it's quite good. And then you can use this to study your actual samples of interest once you have the standards established. Uh, so here is uh, just one example comparing um, fluorine NMR versus video labeling. And this is uh, for the urine profile. And here you can see uh, this is radio labeling. These are some of the major metabolites. Here is your parent, pifloxacin. And then in fluorine NMR, because we have uh, the, some of the standards for the, for the major metabolites, so we were actually able to ID them just by comparing with the uh, standards. And you can see that we were actually able to identify uh, at least four major metabolites here. And this here compares the results for the different metabolites as well as the parent between the two different methods. And you can see the agreement is actually very, very well. Very, very good. Um, 
So finally, I just want to talk a little bit about uh, metabolite ID. And sorry, I don't know how to make this go away. But anyways, so this is uh, something that I did a long time ago when I first joined Lily, not very long after I joined Lily. So we wanted to basically use Flanamar um, to study mixtures of metabolites. So we created this kind of artificial system. This is, uh, you can see that, uh, uh, that that's dexamethasone. And so we have these uh, four met metabolites, two, three, four, five. And you can see this is uh, either uh, with a chloral here, so this is X with a chloral or hydroxyl at the Y position, uh, or we can have both uh, the four or five position uh, chlorinated, or we can have a acyl group and then uh, uh, a chloral uh, at the uh, Y position. So we have basically a mixture of these four different metabolites. And you can see in fluorine NMR, we can actually identify all of them. And so this is a pulse sequence. This is actually a 3D pulse sequence. It's a proton, fluorine, uh, hydronuclear toxy, and then uh, carbon HFQC experiment. So just briefly go, going over the, uh, the pulse sequence, you basically start with uh, fluorine resonance. So that gives you the clean background and you label your fluorine frequency. And then here you just basically do a hydronuclear uh, cross polarization. And we just use actually uh, Dipsy and it works extremely well to our uh, surprise, I guess a little bit. And then you transfer your magnetization to the fluorine. So anything that's coupled to fluorine will be uh, basically, will, will be, um, will receive the magnetic transfer at this point. And because fluorine, uh, you see the large scalar, scalar coupling, sometimes actually with fluorine, you also see through space coupling. So you actually get very extensive uh, transfer to the proton. And then from there, you can do a net type transfer to the carbons that are attached or the proton, uh, that are attached to the, car to the proton. And then you label your carbon frequency. And then uh, here is your multiplicity editor. Um, and then you, you, you do another inept transfer back to your hydrogen and you detect your hydrogen. And you also decouple during uh, both carbon and fluorine during acquisition. So this shows you what the spectrum looks like. Basically in the uh, XY plane, you have your, your HSQC, proton ca or carbon HSQC. But in the Y plane, you have your flooring. So these are all basically uh, edited by the flooring kind of shift, uh, depending on the metabolite. So this is the reference. And then finally, I just want to talk a little bit about some of the practical considerations uh, for running flooring NMR. So, uh, you know, flooring NMR, again, has a very large kind of shift range. It's about 300 ppm. Uh, so that's both, you know, blasting and a curse, right? Uh, it gives you much better resolution, but in the meantime, it makes it much more challenging to cover that entire range with your pulses. So we, what we do is we use uh, both adiabatic pulses and also broadband inversion pulses quite extensively uh, to try to achieve, uh, you know, as as big a coverage as possible. And then um, to to uh, basically get the most benefit. Uh, you you want to have broadband proton decoupling during uh, acquisition. This obviously greatly increases your resolution, so that's critical for metabolite ID. Um, and in terms of hardware requirement, um, you know we actually have a broker QCI probe. It's a cryo probe. It has four channels: proton, fluorine, carbon, and nitrogen. And uh, so we can actually do proton detection and decouple fluorine or fluorine detection decouple uh, proton and actually the other two uh, nuclei as well. Uh, in terms of sample preparation, uh, it really depends on the matrix. Sometimes you have to do a little bit of tweaking. Uh, what we found was, uh, you know, the chemical shift can be quite, uh, uh, can be quite sensitive to pH and so is the line width. So by just playing with that pH a little bit, you can significantly improve the uh, spectral resolution. Um, and then, uh, you know, because this is all quantitative NMR, so doing a quick estimate of the T1 relaxation time 
in your matrix of interest would be very helpful. And then finally, for data analysis, uh, you know, oftentimes, I think the case I showed you is kind of the ideal case, all the metabolites are well resolved. But more often than that, you probably have some overlap. So in that case, uh, you want to use some sort of deconvolution routine, um, you know, whatever your favorite is. And that's usually necessary for, for the quantitation step. So that is all I have. Uh, you know, um, I guess we're probably holding the questions to the end. I want to thank you for your attention. Excellent. Hi, Tao. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, it looks like everybody's holding questions for you. I haven't seen anything showing up in the chat yet, and that's just fine. We'll get there in a minute. All right, bringing us home will be uh, Jose Napolitano, my colleague here at Genentech. Uh, Jose's got some very nice data on reaction monitoring, and he's going to show us why fluorine is such an excellent nucleus for that. Jose, all yours. Thank you, Dave, and thanks uh, to the organizers for the opportunity uh, you know, to show some of our uh, results for the invitation. Um, today, I just wanted to um, share with all of you a couple of ways in which we use floating NMR uh, to analyze tan-dependent systems, uh, you know, with a focus on, on reaction monitoring. Um, uh, just to bring home some of the points that are already Teal and Haitao um, uh, made, uh, why we, we care so much about floating and why Floating is so important for us in pharmaceuticals. Or if we look at the new small molecule new drug approvals in the last couple of years, um, you can count probably 16, 17 fluorinated compounds. Um, you know, and the kind of moieties that contain fluorine are all over the place. You know, you can find uh, trifluoromethyls, different patterns of substitution in benzene rings and even uh, some difluoro moieties around. So yeah, it's, it's very important uh, for pharmaceutical development and hence we um, do more and more work uh, with floating NMR. To show you some of the applications that we commonly do in our lab um, and at the same time bring home some of the advantages of using floating, I prepared this slide, of course we, we commonly do a lot of structural elucidation and verification. And yeah, you can take advantage of the high natural abundance. The fact that it's a, a, a spin one half, and that way you are very comfortable what couplings mean. The couplings are very characteristic, are huge. So it's easy to identify them uh, in proton and floating spectrum. And then you can access, you know, there are uh, a lot of different to the NMR experiments that you can use to support uh, structural elucidation um, uh, analysis. In this case, you know, we like to use this uh, long range HSQ MBC because you take advantage of the long range, the, the magnitude of the long range couplings uh, for fluorine. But other examples are, for example, HOSI experiments. There is a lot that can be done with structural elucidation. Um, <clears throat> we also use it in a regular basis for quantitation, especially in cases where uh, our proton spectra are very complicated. And yeah, here you take advantage of, of the fact that overlap is going to be less likely when you have a, a chemical shift range that is almost 40 times bigger than, than your proton range. And the, the relaxation times are relatively short, comparable to what um, you see uh, on proton QNMR. So I will say that of, of other flavors of quantitative NMR with different nuclei, probably floating is the one that, that resembles more uh, how we commonly do proton uh, NMR. Of course, you have to take into account some of the caveats that Haita already mentioned. So if you, if you combine these two aspects of floating NMR, uh, the structural verification part and the quantitative component of it, you can really tell why we like to use floating for reaction monitoring, you know, it's great sensitivity. The signal dispersion is good. Um, floating is very sensitive to small changes in local environment. So you'll see that a structurally related compounds might overlap on the proton, but you usually see enough separation on the floating to be able to uh, see these compounds clearly. And obviously, you know, you don't have to deal with any solvent interference. So we can run uh, more of our reactions pretty much mimicking the 
uh, reactions conditions given by our chemists using floating NMR. So as a, as a first example, just wanted to show a fluorination reaction, what I think, I, I think makes sense for a floating NMR experiment. This is part of a collaboration with uh, Tristan and Jason in Vancouver. We are just looking at this uh, fluorination of, of the, let me put my pointer so you can see it too, of the four fluorobenzoic uh, acid. And we use this fluorinating agent just to make the, the, uh, the acyl fluoride. And as you can see on the top right hand, trying to monitor this by proton NMR is, is a big problem. Um, you have multiple species that are formed and all the peaks are pretty much in a one and a half ppm window. In turn, when you switch to uh, floating NMR, you really can take advantage of the really large uh, chemical shift range and you are able to follow the study material, your product of interest, a few more products that are also of interest to us. And <clears throat> in this particular case, we can also keep an eye on the fluorinating agent that doesn't have any signals that we can follow on the, on the proton NMR. So the, as you can see, it's very easy to obtain trends uh, and to keep an eye on the ratio between different species in solution. Um, that doesn't mean that you cannot do structural work. Uh, we still can collect experiments like this one. This is just a, a floating carbon HMBC in which we're just trying to track how many of these moieties are present in our uh, solvent and on our reaction system after a given period of time. And yeah, you can see clearly there are signals that are characteristics for this kind of ring in study material, the product interest, and a few more impurities. Um, another, uh, a last example that I wanted to show, it's a, how we use uh, also uh, floating on benchtop NMR. So in this case, uh, you know, the benchtop machine is, is it's great to move around, it's movable compared to our big guys, uh, the high field instruments. So we can use it to just track the reaction progress completion, or in some cases, it might be just to have an idea how stable a product might be. So in this case, we have these, uh, these, uh, this aryl bromine that we treat with a turbo greener reagent to get uh, our, our greener species. And you see that in the, in the proton experiment, you still can get some, some information out of it, but the overlap is causing problems right from the beginning. While in the floating, uh, the signals are well separated and it's easy to track the species of interest over time. Um, if you leave this kind of material for too long, uh, you start see degradation. You will see the proto-demethylation uh, degradation process in this case. Um, just to, pro to produce trifluorotolvin. And over here on the right, what I wanted to show you is just a quick comparison between uh, data collected with proton and doing some feeding and also with floating. And we can see how the, the study material is consumed pretty much in the first five hours. And if you leave the, the, the solution uh, standing around for too long at that temperature, uh, on this long-term stability, we can inform our chemists of how long the material will be stable and how much of the degradation product will be there after a given period of time. So I, I hope that this short presentation give you uh, a flavor of how we're using uh, floating NMR for reaction monitoring. And I will uh, give the control back to Dave. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Jose. Beautiful slides. Um, Excellent presentations all across the board. I think it, it really speaks to the breadth of applications you can use with fluorine NMR. I mean, right across the window, everything you can dream of, everything people do with proton NMR works with fluorine also. We do have several questions coming up in the uh, chat. I'd ask our panelists if they would to please put their video cameras back on and anybody else that's interested and uh, we can answer a few questions. So right off the top, we had a question about the ideal field and how chemical shift anisotropy might play into this. Um, one of you guys want to jump in there? Is there an ID, ideal field and have you seen any CSA issues? 
So I can start out the discussion if you like. Sure. You can hear me? Okay, good. Um, I um, remember when I started at Genentech, we have an 800. And um, at the time, Bruker was, uh, and, and it didn't have a cryoprobe. And at the time, Bruker was producing a cryoprobe that was sort of combined proton fluorine. And so since it's not much more expensive, we decided, I decided to go that path to start, <clears throat> have a system where you can, you can work with high sensitive and everyone is saying, wow, oh, 800 megahertz and fluorine, that's never gonna work because of the CSA. And I'm quite surprised actually that when we actually got to measure the CSA in the free state where the ligand is, is, is in high mobility didn't play a role. And it actually plays in your favor because the moment it is bound, you get a substantial line broadening and relaxation through, through the binding. And I think that sort of plays in your favor. So that my practical experience, and I can't really tell you the, the theoretical uh, explanation of at which field strength the CSA in fluorine will start to play a major role, but that's been my experience just from a practical standpoint. So, so Till, I guess just for clarification, so your application was, you're observing the ligand, right? Not the protein. So the ligand is fluorine labeled in that case? Exactly. But of course, the, the, the measuring principle is the fluor that the ligand binds the protein. Right. So you're, so you're actually comparing. So the CSA is actually working in your advantage. Correct? Exactly, it makes, yes. Makes the line broader, right? Exactly. But I, right. So that's, yeah, that's a good point. I think in my experience, I've also worked with uh, fluorine labeled protein as well. In that case, I think you do want to see the flaring signal. So I think, you know, although, well, we only have a 600, but I suspect in that case, the CSA will uh, be working against you. So going to a lower field of maybe like 500, you know, might actually give you better signal noise. Um, but, you know, um, for small molecules, I think 600 works just fine. For most of the applications that I work we run with. this stuff on six all the time, and it, it has not really been a problem. Interestingly, we've we've got a six and a four with identical HFX uh, systems. I, I may have to go play with that one of these days in my copious spare time. Um, <laughs> Andrew, not a question, but a comment. He's describing the fact that the asymmetry of the C thirteen satellites can sometimes cause problems for people. Um, I would encourage anyone out there, turn your camera on and have a chat with us. But yes, I believe all of us have had to field questions about what are those peaks and what are those impurities? And um, it, it is a nonstop problem to try and explain that to the point where sometimes I prefer to either change the scale, the vertical scale, so people can't really see those satellites or uh, you not even give them the data back directly, just give them the results back that they want. Uh, any other comments on that would be appreciated. Just let me throw one last thing in, uh, if I may. Sure. The example I showed of this work in this, out of Vutri's lab was actually done at 600 megahertz. And this is uh, covalently modified GPCRs. So they, they mutate a cysteine, <clears throat> a certain position to a cysteine, and they, and they, they attach its, its uh, macapto trifluoroethanol. So it's, it's really quite an elegant method in so far that it's, it's quite easy to use, but the spectra look awful. I, I, you know, the, the, you saw the the data that on my slide. And they actually had to do line fitting to to get quantitative information out of this. So um, I I do agree that once you've connected your flu into the protein, CSA starts playing a role. Um, just one just one comment on the isotope pattern for carbon thirteen. You know, if you if you want to convince your chemist, you can also show them. Uh, tetrafluoroborate salt, that you are going to have the peaks from fluorine to uh, boron 11 and boron 10, and those are 80, 20. So, you know, that actually makes a good point for the chemist to understand that there are different species there, or, you know, different isotopic patterns. It, as I say, it is an ongoing discussion. Um, I never thought about using the boron isotopes to do that, though. We have several questions. Ralph, if you're with us, please turn your camera on and talk to us uh, about excitation bandwidth and quantitative NMR and how you get excitation where you need. So just to make sure we're all on the same page, there are two different things here. One would be inversion bandwidth, which is important to be doing you know, a 2D type experiment, most likely. The other is excitation bandwidth, particularly in the quantitative world. Ralph, talk to us, buddy. Hi, Dave. Good to see you. 
Sorry, I just had to go close the door because my children are shouting. Um, oh, it's, it's, I, thought, I thought some of them There you go. Yeah. <laughs> it's, bed, it's bedtime. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I was, um, I just thought I'd put a comment in about the, um, about the, the quantitative nature of, um, of flooring. So a few, a few, um, a couple, few years ago, we did these experiments with this chorus uh, method, which is uh, three, three broadband chirps, um, which are quite nicely lined up together. And they give you, um, I think we got, I think we got about 300 kilohertz um, of, of uniform excitation from those. Um, and that's been developed quite a bit further by Muhammad Ali for Azanda in, uh, in Oxford. Um, so that we, we did those on, um, we used it for fluorine for quantitating some experiment, uh, some, uh, some impurities uh, in, I think it was fluticasone. So it was, it's an, a fluorine containing pharmaceutical. And uh, it works really nicely. You, you basically, you don't have to run a bunch of experiments anymore. You can just run one experiment and you get the full bandwidth in one go. So I'd encourage you to, um, to take a look at those experiments if you want to do some, some quantitative 19F experiments without having to waste a lot of time running loads of different experiments. We, we've got Chorus implemented in our Joel systems and I've run it and it does work. I have to admit that I, however, am lazy and something of a heretic. So the other way you can get around this is quit worrying so much about a 90 degree pulse and just shorten your pulse width to a shorter time. So, I mean, it, it doesn't really matter what your tip angle is. If you just make your, and I've got a, a plot of this in one of the papers, Evgeny Chevchenko actually made this plot up for us a couple of years ago. We published a paper on quantitative flooring. If you just drop your pulse width to two or three microseconds, your bandwidth is pretty good. Um, it, it's, the, it's the lazy man's way of doing chorus, but chorus is obviously a far more elegant experiment. Um, but if, if someone doesn't have it, you can't get around the problem. Don't ignore it. In flooring, it's very real and it will bite you in the you know what. Yeah, I mean, in, in automation, um, I mean, I've got a bunch of chemists in, in our department who use all sorts of horrendous paramagnetic things. They've got uranium in there. They've oh, got, yeah. yeah um, uh, and as soon as they've got anything paramagnetic, you know, chorus starts to break down there as well. So you just want to use maybe, yeah, five, five degree pulse in it. It works fine. You can get 300 ppm of, of excitation pretty un uniformly there. And for, for proton and fluorine, that's fine. You've got plenty of sensitivity. Yep. So when you start even, well, when you go to phosphorus, it's probably okay as well. But if you want to do anything with you know, paramagnetic carbon or paramagnetic nitrogen, then you really start to struggle. So I've got to say that, Jose, I don't believe we've seen a paramagnetic molecule come through in drug development in a while now, but yes. Um, Kevin Gardner, I want to apologize. It's only been a year and a half. I'm still learning how to use these tools. I did not see your hand raised. So Kevin, please, if you've got a comment for us, we'd love to hear it. I sure do. So I'm not allowed to put video on, it looks like, so you're just going to get the still, still vision of me. So I want to pull on the CSA question a little bit more, especially with the comments that Till and Hightow weighed in on. So first of all, uh, thanks for weighing in, number one. Number two, thanks for pointing out the important difference between ligand detect and protein detect methods. I think that's a huge thing here. If we could focus over on the ligand detect side, I'd appreciate people have a broader set of expertise than I do. Um, I'd really like to know on the CSA effects and how they practically impact things on the different kinds of sites that can be fluorinated. I've had a bit of experience with small molecules that are fluorinated at methyl, methylene and aromatic. And that question that I think Siddhartha raised about what's your ideal field strength, from my perspective, really mattered a bunch as to what kind of site you were fluorinated at. So ligand detect, variability on the different kinds of sites that could be fluorinated. What's your experience been? Thanks. Till, do you well, have yeah, let's start out with the, the, the differential mobility of uh, trimethyl, uh, trifluoromethyl groups versus, say, say, aromatics. I think that is um, um, one point. And then, of course, the, the anecdote I told speaks to the overall dynamics within molecules, which, um, because of the f uh, huge uh, spectral width of fluorine and the high sensitivity toward very subtle changes in the chemical environment, 
tell you something about uh, about mobility in molecules. Now, I've not done the uh, the analysis to see whether the mobility is simply a function of, is it aromatic or aliphatic, or I think it's a function of where it sits in the molecule and the, the lo localized dynamics that are happening uh, at that site. So that's sort of my, my take on that. Yeah, and I might add, I mean, obviously with the CF3, you have a factor of three right there, right? So if you're really struggling with sensitivity, you know, the CF3 is, is your friend. Um, and also, Oftentimes, I think the CF3 gives a sharper signal, just probably because it's it's got more uh, mobility there. Um, at least that's been my experience. Yeah, you just need to compare sort of a pie stacked aromatic, you know, versus a methyl group that's obviously not going to make any intermolecular interactions to to reduce sort of its mobility, whereas a, an aromatic actually might do that. All right, thank I you both for your comments. Oh, sure. I, I did just a little bit of metabolite work with the folks here on campus, and uh, I definitely saw a, a larger than I expected benefit from using the CF3s. I never thought about it at the time, but it, it might very well have been a little bit of CSA that I had not considered, but there was no question that the trifluoromethyl groups were even more than three times more sensitive than some of the aromatic fluorines were also in the same molecule. All you really could see were the trimethyls, no matter how much you ran up to your uh, chemical, your uh, signal to noise. And it's an interesting thought. It's something I had not considered. And it's something I will be thinking about next time. Um, yeah, I, I was just, can I just add one more point to that? Uh, you know, I would say, however, working with metabolites, uh, we did, you know, this is more anecdotal. You know, I think CF3 oftentimes, uh, the shift change is smaller. So you have more overlap issues with your metabolite. Whereas yeah. if you have an aromatic CF, the resolution is usually much greater um, just because it's more sensitive, right? It's, it's experienced a bigger change in the environment. So yeah, I guess it's a balance between sensitivity and resolution. Yep. All right. I don't see anything else coming up in the chat. Anybody got any other talk? Well, then let me let me throw in another thing in. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm oh, being too talkative here. So you can tell me to shut up at any time. You know that. You know but, that. Um, no. but yeah, go ahead. So so when Claudio Dalvit, uh, I think one of the pioneers is sort of using um, fluorine and fragment screening, uh, developed his methods, and this sort of connects to wanting to decouple the fluorine sweep width, right? Um, he developed methods that relaxation enhance the bound state so that you get more of a pronounced effect when the ligand is binding the protein versus <clears throat> the free state. And so uh, I think you could, my sentiment was you can resolve, you can get the same effect by going to a higher field. So the, the, the whole method development centered around enhancing the relaxation in that bound state. And since that uh, is connected to the CSA, um, you know, perhaps I was lucky that we did a lot of this work at 800 megahertz. And then that loops back to the, my, um, a question that I always have, well, why do you actually want to de decouple fluorine or why do you want that huge sweep width to be able to decouple fluorine? Because, and Ralph, I'm, I'm sort of disappointed that you don't have bedtime stories for your kids about NMR and you just get them to join <laughs> your Zoom meeting, but, um, you know, if, if you're looking at one specific metabolite, you, you're not going to have 300 ppm sweep width, right? <clears throat> you're, go you're going to know where your signal is and it's not going to change by say 100 ppm in, in one or the other direction, or am I wrong there? Um, Jose, you want, you want to talk about some of the fluorine spectra we've collected? Admittedly, it's, it's in the fluorination reaction monitoring, but the sweep widths, it's different than metabolites, but it can be pretty large. So, you know, for some of the reactions that you see over there, yeah, the, the sweep widths can be very, very large. When we are doing more uh, quantitative NMR for, you know, potency determination, then we tend to stick to very narrow windows. Um, and that way, you know, we, we try to, to avoid those kind of problems. Till one of the compounds I looked at metabolites of, I, I off the top of my head, I know there were CF3s 
and we did have some aliphatic fluorines. They had to have been 100, 120 ppm windows. So not huge, but certainly nothing to be sneezed at. If you okay, um, yeah, no, I get it. Yeah. I mean, as some of the molecules Jose showed, I mean, some of the molecules we're seeing these days in drug development have four, five, six, even eight fluorine atoms in them, and then multiple fluorine uh, moieties, chemical moieties. So the, the chemical shift window for one molecule can be large. If you're looking at metabolites, so you don't necessarily have to look at the whole window. And, and I'll throw in, you know, in the context of screening, um, I designed the library then you did that you would have a plate of more aromatic compounds uh, and a plate for more aliphatic compounds. And then you basically hone in on that window and that sort of resolves some of those sweep width issues. Yeah, I think for like, you know, a fragment of screen, right? Where you have a mixture of maybe CF3 and CF compounds. I mean, I think you could actually treat them as, you know, you just acquire two spectrum, right? That's one way to get around this. If yeah. you really want to get them both in one shot, I think while well, the 90 is usually not a problem, I think in that case, the spectral width, it's not going to be 300 ppm. It's probably more going to be like, maybe less than 100 ppm, right? Because I think it's roughly minus 70 for the CF3, minus 120 for the CF. So you have uh, maybe a 80 to 100 ppm window there. So the 90 is usually still good enough. And besides there, it's not exactly quantitative in a mark because you just want to see an um, reduction in the signal intensity. Exactly, yeah. um, But for the 180, because you're doing a spin echo, so it's, it's more important. And for that, uh, we had a success using uh, broadband in inversion pulses. These, are, these were the pulses that we developed in uh, A.G. Shaka's lab when I was a grad student a long time ago. Um, those are relatively short. Um, they also have very good coverage, and we had a lot of luck with those. They seem to work well. Andrew makes another comment. Andrew, you can talk to us if you like about um, the, the beauty of running a doubly decoupled fluorine and 19, I'm sorry, proton and fluorine decoupled carbon experiment. Um, I, I've, given, I've given a talk too many times where I showed some of those data. And over the years, since we've had HFX capability for a number of years, I thought we'd be doing a whole lot more esoteric experiments to do structure work. We do occasionally get a molecule that's proton deficient. And so you have to do some kind of fancy 2D fluorine NMR to try and understand what's going on. Hands down, I agree with you, the most valuable experiment that we run on those systems would be proton and fluorine decoupled for carbons. It, the chemists don't ask questions. They all, they like the way it looks and it makes a huge difference in your sensitivity for those strongly coupled carbon signals where you have a lot of fluorines. I mean, CF3s are the, obviously the example. Um, it, they're hard to find even if you know what you're looking for sometimes. So I agree with you completely. I, I, he says in his uh, comment here, you know, as a mere chemist, yeah, dude, we're there with you. Bill Reynolds, I don't have an answer for you, Bill. Let's see if anybody else does. Anybody tried Hadamard for fluorine signals? Particularly, he's talking about the F1 dimension of a 2D experiment. I can honestly say no. I, not us. I haven't tried that, but it's an interesting idea. I mean, if you have good resolution along the fluorine dimension, yeah, you could use that. To shorten your experiment. Yeah, it's. I've always I've always shied away from Hadamard because you have to have a lot of information before you begin. But in this particular example, it's not that hard to get. It, yeah, that might that's, Bill. That's a really interesting idea, actually. Um, Siddhartha, I see your hand up. I'm actually I didn't see your hand up. John sent me a message about it, but I'm in. Yeah, yeah. Hi. Uh, if I may ask a question, I mean. Have you all had any experience uh, with fluorinated peptides as ligands and, you know, uh, uh, and using fluorine in a transferred NOE experiment? I mean, how has it, I mean, do you all have any experience with this? Hello? Oh, we're talking, you, you know, I would say it's a great question. Uh, uh, peptides is, is a, a burgeoning field, I think. Uh, pharmaceutical industry is looking at peptides and of course uh, fluorine is, is, is a good nucleus to sort of apply. I, I lack the practical experience and I can just pass the, the question to, to the audience or to the, my colleagues here. Anybody tried this? 
I guess is a question about can you do transfer NOE or is this would be heteronuclear NOE, right? Hosey, basically, HF Hosey. Was that the question? Yes. Yeah, yeah. What we, we do run hoses once in a while. We've had some experience with those, uh, not in a ligand binding kind of an application. We're more looking at uh, structure stuff or just looking for exchange experiments. Um, all I will say to you is that fluorine is surprisingly promiscuous in how you get NOEs from it. Um, I've been surprised at some of the hoses that we have measured and how sensitive they can be. I do believe that experiment would work. I, I do believe you could get a, a transfer uh, NOE in a binding type experiment based on how easy it is to get hosies. My only concern would be hosies are surprisingly hard to interpret sometimes because you get so many NOEs from even one fluorine atom. It can be a little bit challenging to decide. It, you, it, there can be some spectral crowding, particularly in the proton window. Um, it's a very interesting idea. It's an excellent question. Uh, just or, like, or even if you have a remote, um, just as a follow-up, if you have two remote fluorines on a peptide, you know, and then look at a transfer NOE for binding. Um, kind of like the early experiments that Chlor and all did with peptides, Maris Chlor, you know, the, the original transfer NOE experiments, but just using fluorine as labels, readout labels. So, so I would ask then, you're asking basically what's the confirmation of your peptide in the balance Yes, state? yes, yeah. yes, yeah, okay. yes, yeah. I mean, so then is there it, any... would be a, it would be a fluorine, fluorine homonuclear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, oh. yeah. I mean, is there any advantage or, you know? Uh... I was saying, have we ever run that experiment? I don't think we've ever collected one of those data sets. No, we haven't. Yeah, American fluorine. Homonuclear fluorine NOE. Given some of the molecules we see, it would work. I mean, we've got enough fluorines in there, you could definitely get information. <laughs> so, uh, thank you all very much. Yeah. Looks like we still got 76 people in the call. All right, come on, you sleepers. Questions, anybody? I see, like this, I, I see this comment could be a good exam question. That is just so nice. It's, uh, I think it relates to the coupling pattern that you will see if you record a proton spectrum of a boron uh, compound. And you see, I think you see a septet and a, I'm not quite sure, quintet at the same time because you have the two boron nuclei that have different uh, um, uh, spin sums. And so you see both of these couplings at the same time. So is that, uh, is that the exam question? Because of course, we want to prepare you for your exams as best as we can. <laughs> is that the answer to the exam question? Well, yeah, I'll be framing the question for the exam. So <laughs> I let okay. the students figure it out. <laughs> Very good. I've got a tetrafluoroborate salt in the uh, sample changer right now. I may have to go run that experiment just to have a look at it. Yeah, and, and maybe you could send me the spectrum. I'll send you an email. Yeah, please do. Thanks. So Bill's talking to us about seeing CSA. It's interesting. I mean, it's, it's sad in some ways. It, it's a very, very on-point question and not something I had considered carefully. Um, I'm going to start thinking a lot more about CSA and some of the data that we're looking at. I do believe it has had an effect. And we're currently looking at a lot of things with formulations where we're looking at either solution aggregation or potentially binding. Um, I haven't paid much attention to fluorine in those studies, but it might be even more valuable than the protons if we can get it to work. So I, I would then throw in the question, I don't have experience now what we have 1.2 gigahertz machines around. I know there is a big discussion around the CSA for the carbonyl in the peptide backbone and all the protein-based methods and that you will be running into difficulties because your, your carbonyl, <clears throat> which is sort of one of the most sensitive 3Ds, right? The HNCO or whatever, 
that uh, the CSA would start playing a role. And I tried to compare the intensities between six and 800 megahertz and really didn't see an effect. I wonder, is there anybody that has compared say a 600 to a 1200 spectrum, say an HNCO, whether there, there, there is something you can, you can pick up there and that the CSA actually does uh, play a role here at higher field strengths? I mean, I just, based on literature, I do know that when uh, Louis K worked on very large proteins, uh, any experiments going through the carbonyl, he preferred at 600 rather than 800. So HNCOCA, HNCO, HNCOCACB, especially for the malate synthase G, which is around 80 kilodaltons. Uh, he would, I think in the paper, he does mention that there are significant sensitivity uh, losses in those experiments. So he prefers to, he preferred to do it at 600 for those very large proteins because of the CSA uh, carbonyl. Thank you very much. Yeah. Right, yeah. Good point. I tell you, you want to talk to uh, Martin's question about uh, NOE crossings and zeros? I think you probably um, saw that than I do. I guess it's okay. About question about Hosey, right? Yeah, I guess it would probably be just like the homonuclear uh, NOE. It'll depend on you know the size of the molecule, basically where it crosses the zero. Um, yeah, I've never done that for a, for a protein. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see if it's the sun is inverted in the in the protein like what you see with proton. We've had at least three doctoral theses pop up on our chat since we started this. That is not something, again, something I never considered. I've certainly never measured it. Um, but yeah, I, 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 think, I think that could be exactly the same concern. Um, if somebody else out there has a much more ex expert opinion on it, I'd love to hear from you. It'd be straightforward to test really. Dave, I think, isn't it useful to think about this in a normal homonuclear NOE, you've got one signal which you see, which is pretty big and pointing down, for example, and then you have the other signals which uh, either have the same sign or the opposite sign. But if you're doing a hosey, then you're inverting a signal which isn't actually appearing in your spectrum. So um, there's, there's that consideration, which I think, so you can't, you can't actually see whether it's the same sign as the signal you're inverting or not. Um, that doesn't mean that there's not the zero crossing still, right? So you could still have signals that are up or down, but you can't tell if, so, um, yeah, if it's if it's got the same sign as the signal you're inverting or the, not. I don't the think. experiment that we're running, I I just I want to say is absolute intensity. Um, uh, it's correct. I, I don't I don't believe it's space density. That doesn't necessarily mean there isn't a zero crossing problem if we had been unlucky with the correlation times. I, know, I think yeah, I think there is a zero crossing problem if you're if you're unlucky. Yeah, yeah, I, I think so too. I, yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Having dealt mostly with molecules that are small enough, I didn't have to worry about it. I didn't worry about it, but uh, it, it's it is an interesting pro problem. I'll I just, I just think whether well, can you use the rosy to get around that make this a bit more tricky. I guess you have to use. Um, two lots of uh, spin locks at the same time. But, but that is a question that came to my mind as well. Is there actually a ROSI for 19F? The first question would be a homonuclear 19F ROSI and then the heteronuclear one. I'm sure someone's done that. It sounds like a hell of a spin lock to me. Um, well, yeah. well uh, but that was the experiment that um, Jose was, was it, Jose? Oh, no, it was the guy from Lilly, sorry. Um, was doing for the toxi, right? He was doing a spin. Yeah, that was, that was me, right? Yeah. yeah. It was a, uh, right, just cross polarization, right? Yeah. So you and should, it worked that... quite well, actually. Yeah. So, yeah, I think you should be able to do that for, for heteronuclear rosy, I guess. Yeah. HF yeah. You just have to yeah. Power down a bit and it should work, right? Never tried it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, how often do you get the NOE zero crossing for a, because it, I'm just trying to think how the 
how do the uh, the different geomagnetic ratios come into play there? I'm not sure if the NOE crossing, zero crossing is as much of a problem. So Tim says that this actually is, there's a figure for this in uh, Newhouse's book. Um, I certainly don't remember seeing it. That's why we invite people like Tim to come and, and help us out here. Um, so obviously someone's thought about this, probably calculated it. It's, it's available. We just have to go look it up. Well, I remember when the the uh, the fifteen n relaxation using uh, the NOE came up. There was I remember there was discussion that it is serendipitous that actually there is a positive signal to be observed in those those fifteen n um, uh, relaxation experiments, and that's just simply a question of the gyromagnetic ratio. So I I agree it's probably a question of trying it out. Phil, do you know of anybody doing uh, trozies with fluorine? Because uh, Bill Reynolds says they saw an example of that in the 70s on an XL100. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, I think somebody at Harvard or uh, Dana Farber is doing that. Harry Athenari, I think, published some 19F rosy uh, information. I don't know, Misha, are you still online? Uh, are you still in contact with Harry? And do you, can you elaborate on that? Yes, they did publish uh, fluorine trosy. It works. It, it works really well, and for for a right protein, it can greatly increase the sensitivity of detection. It's not you know fluorine obviously does not naturally occur in proteins, so you have to put fluorine on it one way or another. But if all you need is to detect it, that's a great way to do it, and you can lower the uh, lower the amount of protein that you need for label detection. Yeah, thanks very much. It, it's funny how many times I've discovered fluorine works better than I thought it would for so many different things. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm often very empirical, throw in the magnet, give it a try. I'm like, wow, that was actually pretty easy. And the sensitivity is great. And it, and it actually worked. Um, I'm, I've become the prophet for fluorine. Yeah, I think the cryo probe definitely helps with the flooring. Yeah. So it it's an interesting point. I I we had this discussion some time ago here at Genentech. Um, we're running a room temperature probe with flooring on the inner coil, and our sensitivity is the specs very high. Um, I, I at, at that time and for the specific cryo probe that we quoted. Our sensitivity was about the same as a cryoprobe. I believe that cryoprobe was designed such that fluorine was on the low frequency coil. It was, it was dipped on low frequency. So obviously that's going to significantly decrease your sensitivity. Um, but it's, if you're not sure, uh, I'm just gonna say that a, a, a fluorine dedicated probe with fluorine on the high band coil on an, in an inverse style probe, um, the sensitivity might be good enough to get away with murder. <laughs> it's interesting. So, so I I will throw in. You know, I mentioned we got this sort of dual use uh, fluorine using the uh, the proton coil on a cryo probe, and that is always a compromise. You always either lose proton sensitivity and gain fluorine, or the other way around. And that was sort of a bit disappointing. Brooker now builds these uh, dual probes where you can, which you want to do. You want to also be able to decouple protons, of course. But again, the, the expected sensitivities are, I found slightly disappointing. I thought that they would be better, even though the cryoprobe has made a huge difference. And I'll, I'll just point this out that in, in drug discovery, of course, you're not working at millimolar concentrations. Uh, you have the problem if you want ligand interacting with a protein and that ligand is, is 500 micromolar, then you're going to get interaction because the sheer concentration of that ligand is going to push it to some unspecific interaction with that protein. So you're going for the lowest concentration you can do as uh, the example I showed was a 20 micromolar ligand, 10 micromolar protein. That's sort of the size of it. Actually, it would even be better if you could go, you know, one micromolar protein and, and five micromolar ligand or even in the nanomolar area where typically an HTS will run. So that sensitivity that you get with the cryoprobe is, was really quite important for, for the work I was doing. So it looks like both Tim and Josh have downloaded figures for us. I'm 
clicking buttons madly here. As yeah, well. I just saw those. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah, so there's the, the figure Tim was talking about from the book. Can you share that? Uh, or I can try to share it. Well, or it can... actually has exactly the answer. The, there is uh, uh, around one, a tau C of one, uh, you have a zero crossing for fluorine. And it looks like Tim shared with us the, that's got to be the, um, the fluorine, the tetrafluoroborate uh, spectrum. <laughs> Sorry yeah. guys, I'm gonna have to run. My battery is dying. Um, I have two minutes left, so. That's out, thank you. Um, it's been great. Oh, same here, I just noticed. Thanks for pointing We're that out. We're on time anyway. Anybody else, last minute questions? Sodium tetrafluoroborate, thanks, Tim. I guess. Dave, hi everyone. You wanna sign us off? I guess since batteries are dying that uh, it's probably time to wrap up. <laughs> Hello, Dave. I'm, I'm, yep, Dave, okay, Don, any last words? Okay, so I, this has been one of the best uh, discussions, open discussions that we've had, and at least one of the better in many of our meetings. So I thank uh, all the people that participated in, in, uh, in actually coming on and asking their questions in, per in person. Uh, so uh, with the, is John around still here? I, I'm, st I'm still here, Dave, and I will uh, second your sentiment. Uh, today was an absolutely exceptional meeting, and uh, many thanks to uh, Dave Russell, Jose, Till, and uh, Hightow. Uh, very much appreciate uh, uh, all of you spending, our, uh, spending your time with us, and uh, certainly to uh, uh, all of the uh, participants as well. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, just a couple of uh, uh, last-minute remarks. Uh, we will be putting out a uh, call for nominations uh, very soon for the, uh, uh, well, the now annual Ivan Founders Award, and uh, will be presented uh, uh, once again uh, 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 during the uh, uh, 22 uh, ENC in uh, Orlando. And uh, next, uh, next uh, Ivan Zoom meeting coming up uh, November 18th, uh, reaction monitoring by uh, NMR. And uh, that begins at uh, 1 p.m. Uh, uh, and then 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, we're saying goodbye, I guess, for the uh, season to uh, daylight savings time, uh, unfortunately. But uh, once again, uh, uh, thank you all for uh, attending today uh, and uh, especially to our uh, speakers. And uh, Dave, I'll back to you for any uh, final word and to uh, close things out. Okay, I guess I, thanks for all all those comments and I guess I will close things out and um, I will use our nifty uh, Ivan gavel and so with that <laughs> <laughs> thanks Dave okay thanks my panelists you guys are great thanks everyone it's been a pleasure thank you very much <laughs>